for Business for me is the most visible manifestation of Quaker worship. It is, a, it is us sitting together waiting on the Spirit to speak to us in this moment today about an issue that is in front of us today, including what color we should pick for the carpet in the fellowship hall. And in this way, what happens in business meeting is not really decision making at all. It isn't just an extremely inefficient alternative to Robert's rules of order. It's a, the way that Quakers do business is that we meet in worship to seek God's guidance on a question. And sometimes what's revealed to us is something completely unexpected and new. You may remember about what I said about not preparing a sermon to come into meeting for worship. So if this is a meeting for worship for the conduct of business, does that mean that we don't prepare because we want to be fully open to the spirit? Well, no. You have to prepare for business meeting. And we talked yesterday a bit about threshing sessions, which are meant for us to bring new facts and questions together in order to prepare ourselves for the discernment of how to go forward. So what do you do? You, you do your homework. And then you take, you, you take the question as far as your, your personal intellect can take it. And you walk into business meeting. And you sit down and you hear a proposal. Out of the silence, you hear a proposal that's usually been developed carefully by a committee and a recommendation, and, um, and sometimes you just immediately know, oh, that sounds right. I think, I, I can feel that's the right thing for us to do, and, uh, and it's easy to approve the recommendation. Sometimes you're sitting in meeting and, and you think, I have something to add. That was great, but you know, in my preparation, I've had a different insight from my life experience or a new fact and I will stand and I will, I will say that and I will, as we sometimes say, I will lay it on the meeting. I will make it part of the process. And the important part of this is that once it is part of the process, it's not mine. I have given it up. I am now going to enter the process of discerning where we are moving in the meeting. You can't listen and defend your position. If that happens, you can't hear what else is happening in meeting. And it can be very freeing to know that you're not personally responsible for getting to the best place or the best solution. And not only that, it kind of recognizes our humanness. You know, it's a whole lot easier for me to accept that what God thinks we ought to do is better than what I think we ought to do. It might be a little harder for me to accept that what Michael ha thinks we ought to do than what is better than what I think we ought to do. But if I have entered business meeting in the right frame of mind with an open heart, I may hear God's guidance in something that Michael says. And if the meeting moves in that direction, I will leave with joy because I didn't come into the meeting to win. I came to find out what God had in store for me and for us as a group. So what's happening? What's the clerk doing sitting in the facing bench during this? Well, the clerk is an active guide to this process. And because of the specific and important role of the clerk, if she, she must clear away her own leadings on it, on an issue. As a matter of fact, if she has a strong leading on an issue, what she should do is ask someone else to clerk that item so that she can share her wisdom with the meeting and move and be part of that side of the process. Because what's happening with a clerk is that the clerk has to be very open, very sensitive, seeking how to feel, to sense where the meeting is moving. And you can feel when 
unity is arising and when murkiness is leaving and clarity is emerging. The clerk may sense that about a part of a question. For example, this discussion could be going on for a while and the clerk would say, you know, friends, I sense that we agree that we need a carpet in the fellowship hall. We need a new carpet in the fellowship hall. We don't know yet what color, what kind, but can we approve getting a new carpet for the fellowship hall? And if we can reach unity on that, then we minute that and we go back to the question. Let's continue our prayerful consideration of the other aspects of our decision. And piece by piece by piece, we get to the full answer. Sometimes the clerk will sense that the meeting has turned into a debate. And at that time, she'll call for some silence. And this isn't just some kind of cooling off period. We sink into worship. And in that worship, we shift from defending a position to again being open to finding a way forward. Now, it's good to think about what a clerk does because even though you may not consider that you'll ever be the clerk of your monthly meeting, you're likely to someday clerk a committee meeting. And committees do their business in exactly the same way and it gives you the same opportunity for a sacramental encounter with God and you need to practice how you can sense those openings in a group. Sometimes, of course, there's a sense that we are not clear. We may be exhausted, but we're not clear. And the clerk may say at that time, friends, we have to lay this over. I can sense we are not going to be able to reach clarity on this today. And that gives us more time in ourselves and among each other to, to process this. And we come back together the next month in business meeting and we are at a higher level and we can move forward. But sometimes you're sitting in meeting and you realize that you can feel that the meeting has moved towards unity but you yourself still have some reservation, something that is hanging back. And before you speak to that, there's a question you should ask yourself. So is my sense of what God or the divine will or spirit or truth calls our meeting to do in this moment based on my sense of that transcendent calling, or is it based only on my preferences, prejudices, or convenience? Sitting humbly and in prayer with that question will often lead us back to feeling in unity with the meeting. But what if we don't? What if we hold this concern and we believe that it is from a transcendent place? I would suggest to you that one step you can do is to rise and ask the clerk to recognize that you have a concern, that you don't that you will stand aside, you, you feel that the meeting has been led to move forward, but you want to minute your concern. That can be a gift to the meeting because if you articulate your concern, that concern stays with the meeting. And as they move forward on the path that they have discerned we should follow together, they continue to test it against that concern. And this is a wonderful thing because it means we didn't vote you down. We don't ball up your thoughts and throw them away and head forward. They stay with us on the journey. Now, everyone has heard, you know what I'm going to say now, 
about standing in the way. There is a Quaker lore that any individual can stand in the way of a decision and prevent the decision from being taken. This is not entirely true. Standing in the way is a mutual responsibility between the individual and the meeting to test our sense of the truth as we are imperfectly able to sense it at the time. But no one, after prayerful consideration by the meeting, can stand in the way of a decision without the meeting's permission. The meeting can proceed in loving tenderness to those who cannot join the decision. So what this means to me is that before you abandon that sense of the meeting that you felt the minute before the, the friend spoke and said there was a concern, the minute before that, that sense of the meeting, before you can abandon that, you have to ask the same question. Is that prompting to abandon the sense that you had coming from a transcendent place? Or is it because this friend, this guy's your friend and you don't want him to feel alone and unsupported? Or you feel sort of uncomfortable and you'd rather create an artificial sense of unity than to actually go forward and wait for this friend to follow along. If the friend's message doesn't actually move the sense of the meeting, then the meeting should move forward in the way that it has chosen. Because that's the answer to the question that has been perceived at, at that time. And nobody said this process is easy. You have to trust the process. That means you have to trust that the spirit is guiding the process. You have to trust the people in the process. And it is always hard to trust people with something that is this central. But this process of discernment requires our attention and our practice because it makes the rest of our beliefs possible because we are a non-creedal faith. And this frees us from the restrictions of a, an ancient text or a set of prescriptive rules, but it binds us to the hard process of discernment of discerning what the inner teacher tells us about what to do now. And we must stay open to change in that process. Um, Elias Hicks, who we talked about with uh, uh, Michael Raised and sort of the grandfather of our liberal friends, um, was very, very devoted to the idea of revelation and was concerned for its health in the society. And he was asked to write a memoir and he declined. And he declined because of his concern about the process of continuing revelation. He said, could I but pen down something that might be useful to the present and succeeding generation, and then be obliterated, it might not be amiss. But as I am looking forward in the faith that greater and brighter things will be opened to a succeeding generation than I and the people in the present generation can bear, this makes me unwilling to leave anything of my experience that might tend to hinder the reception of those new and advanced revelations. He was concerned that friends would look back and feel content with his experience instead of staying open to new revelation. 
one of the ways that we Quakers stay open to new revelation is our practice of using queries. And queries are open questions. Many religious traditions use a question and answer format. I, I grew up learning a catechism, but you see there was a question and an answer. And I have to tell you, if I had forgotten the question and I only had the answer, most of the folks would have been fine with that. We don't have an answer. We have a question that we continue to test our understanding against. And that is how we find, that is our mechanism for a reception of new and advanced revelation. And that doesn't only give an opportunity to transform our meetings, our monthly meetings or our yearly meetings. I have come to believe that is why we can transform the world. And I came to this understanding after reading a book called From Peace to Freedom, it'll be in the slides, by Brashan Carey. So Carey is a non-Quaker. He is a student of rhetoric and he's British. And he wrote a book about the rhetoric that was used to propel the argument against slavery in the 19th century, starting in about 1800 in Britain and moved it to uh, the place of abolition. And uh, as he was writing that book, it became clear to him uh, that Quakers, that, that all of the rhetoric, all of the rhetoric of abolition came from one place and it came from Quakers. And he thought that was odd. And so he finished his book and he laid it down and then he decided he had to explore why it was a relatively small group of people not the Anglican Church or the Congregational Church in the United States, but the Quakers that created a whole language that allowed the world to talk about abolition. And so Mr. Carey took his suitcase and he went to Swarthmore, PA, and he went into the college library and he read 150 years of Philadelphia Yearly Meeting minutes. And in that, he saw he, he perceived an arc, a journey that was made possible by what he called, and I love this, the Quaker ritual of queries. This is what we call, friends, business meeting. But he was fascinated by this because he saw that what happened over that period of time was that questions were opened and partially answered and brought back and challenged. And that this method, as opposed to, we're gonna sit over here and decide truth for all time. This mechanism that allowed for more light, allowed for challenges by John Woolman and Benjamin Lay, who he discusses. And it moved the society forward in maybe what were baby steps, but when they reached the end, the whole society was there together in clarity to reject slavery. So yeah, it took a hundred years, but to me, that piece of it is still kind of a miracle because slavery had always been with us. The people who were finally able to read texts because the printing press, etc. in the 1600s, they looked at classical texts and there was slavery. They looked in the Old Testament and there was slavery. They looked in the New Testament and there was slavery. And they looked in the world around them and there was slavery. It struck me that no person who signed the Germantown Declaration finding that slavery was inconsistent with their Christian religious principles. Not one of those people had ever experienced a society in which there were not slaves or lived in an economy that was not deeply entrenched, a global economy linked to slavery. How could they imagine a path away from that world? And I think it was because of Quaker discernment. 
that open them not to just their own imaginations, but to spiritual leadings. Interestingly, Kerry also found that Quaker business practice lined up well with political change. He said, political change is usually dependent on discursive structures that allow change to first be imagined, next to be advocated, and finally to be enacted. And he found that Quaker process was exactly that kind of discursive structure. What I would say is it's a way to keep our minds and hearts open until we can bear the new light that is being given us. And an example of, I mean, a really practical example of continuing revelation is his charting from the early queries that talked about just sort of being not cruel to slaves, to rejecting slavery, and all the stations in between. That shows an arc of continuing revelation. And he gives a great example of that. It must have, now at this time, by the way, Quakers had not rejected slavery. They were still just sort of questioning what was going on. But he says it must have been clear to most of the Quakers in Pennsylvania and New Jersey in the 1720s, therefore, that slavery was not an unquestionable fact of nature, but instead an artificial system that could be challenged and which had been challenged. I think this is why Quakers have often been ahead of the curve of the rest of society in embracing social change. Because rather than accepting that women are subordinate to men or that people are, are supposed to dominate the environment or that gender is binary or that marriage is between a man and a woman, we had a mechanism to instead of accepting these as unquestionable facts of nature, discern whether they were instead an artificial system imposed by mankind that we could reject and listen instead for God's plan. So fundamentally what discernment means is that Quakers are believers that are always forward looking, looking for God wants what God wants us to do next. And I feel strongly that there are stirrings today in the society. Any number of yearly meetings are feeling a shift from a non-racist non position to a call to be an anti-racist institution. And as we struggle to discern where this shift is taking us, we don't have to justify this change by going back and trying to distort a text that was written 2,000 years ago before we can move forward. We don't even have to find it consistent with recent or historical practice. We can just ask God for new light to show us where and how to move forward now. This is what discernment is. It takes practice. It's hard, but it is central and it is transformative. So when we're all meeting physically again in the world, go to business meeting. When you go into your committee meetings, feel sink down into it as a sacramental space. Because by making these decisions, we can change the world.